On the 10th of January, 1832, during his famous voyage of discovery on HMS Beagle, Charles Darwin wrote in his diary, I proved today the utility of a contrivance which will afford me many hours of amusement and work. It's a bag, four feet deep, made of bunting, and attached to a semicircular bow. This, by lines, is kept upright and dragged behind the vessel. This evening, it brought up a mass of small animals, and tomorrow I look forward to a greater harvest. The masses of life that Darwin caught in his net were plankton, tiny animals called zooplankton and plant-like cells called phytoplankton. These microscopic creatures that drift at the mercy of the ocean currents underpin the whole marine food chain. They also influence almost every aspect of our lives, from the oxygen in the air to petrol in our cars and the landscape around us. They create the smell of the seaside and the clouds in the sky, and they play a central role in the global carbon cycle. Phytoplankton, like these diatoms, each smaller in diameter than a strand of human hair, begin the marine food chain. They contain chlorophyll and other pigments which they use to harness sunlight, converting carbon dioxide in the seawater into organic carbon compounds which form the tissues of their body. This process, called photosynthesis, is the same process that land plants use to grow, and oxygen is one of the byproducts. The phytoplankton are so numerous that they account for approximately 50% of all photosynthesis on Earth, and so 50% of the oxygen in the air we breathe. Characterized by a glass-like cell wall made of two silica shells that fit together like a pillbox, diatoms are the most common type of phytoplankton. Although many diatoms live as single cells, some occur as long chains, often taking on beautiful shapes. This is another type of phytoplankton that lives as colonies of cells held together by a jelly-like matrix. Like many phytoplankton, they can cover vast areas of the sea when they bloom in huge numbers. Swirls of foam on the sea surface are a telltale signal that a bloom has occurred in the water below. The foam is due to waves binding the sticky remains of the dead colonies together. Eventually, this foam may be blown onto beaches by the wind, where it's often thought wrongly to signal pollution. It is chemicals released by decaying phytoplankton that help create the familiar smell of the seaside that the Victorians called the sea air. One of these chemicals is dimethyl sulfide, or DMS for short. When this chemical enters the atmosphere, it reacts with sunlight to create particles that attract water droplets to form the clouds in the sky. These white coccolithophores are also phytoplankton. They gain their characteristic pale appearance from chalk plates of calcium carbonate with which they cover their surface. When a bloom of these phytoplankton die, their chalky plates are shed into the water where they act like tiny mirrors reflecting sunlight. This gives the sea a milky appearance that can even be seen from space. It is the remains of coccolithophores that created the massive chalk cliffs and downlands of southern England during the Cretaceous period of Earth's history. The burial of the carbon within the chalk plates of coccolithophores links the land with the sea. 
on land, rocks like granite are worn down by the weather as the rock minerals react with carbon dioxide dissolved in rainwater. After rivers carry the weathered minerals to the sea, coccolithophores and diatoms use them to build their chalk and silica skeletons. When the dead remains of these phytoplankton sink to the seabed, one half of the carbon dioxide used in the weathering of rocks becomes buried in the sediments, where it remains locked away for hundreds of millions of years. Volcanic eruptions eventually return the buried carbon to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide gas. The manufacture of cement from calcium carbonate rocks releases carbon dioxide to the atmosphere and is a man-made addition to the natural regeneration process. The phytoplankton is the food of grazing animals like these copy pods, each smaller than a grain of rice. They're also eaten by these krill that use their comb-like forelimbs to sieve their food from the water. These tiny animals are the first step in the transfer of organic carbon upwards through the marine food chain. The next level up in the plankton food chain sees copepods and krill in turn eaten by carnivores like amphipods. Often found in large swarms, these meat-eaters have large insect-like eyes to help them hunt their prey. Amphipods are not alone as hunters. There are many other predators to make life in the plankton perilous. These predators include the transparent arrow worms with their bristle-like jaws. Fast-swimming paddle worms without any jaws, which literally suck their prey to death and sea gooseberries that use retractable sticky tentacles to catch their food. Not living up to their common name of sea angels, these sea slugs use the wing-like extensions of their foot to chase their prey. Related to sea angels, sea butterflies also use their modified foot to swim. They catch their food by casting a fishing net made of mucus into the water into which other plankton become entangled. The shell of sea butterflies is made of aragonite, a form of calcium carbonate. Sea angels also have a small shell made of aragonite when they're young. When atmospheric carbon dioxide dissolves in seawater, it forms a weak acid. Scientists are concerned that increasing ocean acidity due to rising levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide may cause the shells of these creatures to dissolve. While all of the creatures we've seen so far spend their whole life drifting at the ocean's surface, some animals complete only a part of their life cycle there. These are the juvenile stages of creatures that will end up living on the seabed such as the larvae of crabs and shrimps, urchins and starfish, cockles, mussels, snails and worms. Not only is the plankton a good place for these juveniles to feed and grow, but the planktonic larval stage also provides a way for animals that live on the seabed to use the ocean currents to disperse to new places. These larval forms show some amazing adaptations to survive life in the plankton. Most crab larvae have long spines that are thought to protect them against being eaten. And just as humans can float on their backs in the sea by extending arms and legs, the young crab's spines may help it to float. Looking like a javelin, the juvenile porcelain crab takes its spiny extensions to an extreme length. After feeding and growing in the plankton, 
the crab larva molts into a much more crab-like form. Now lacking long spines and equipped with a pair of claws, it feeds voraciously before sinking to the seabed, where it will turn into a young crab. These are the larvae of barnacles. Using the currents for dispersal is especially important for barnacles, as most barnacles live their adult lives glued firmly to a rock. Although this larva looks very similar to that of a barnacle, to this day, no one knows what animal it will become as an adult. First discovered in 1887 in the sea off the German coast, these puzzling creatures occur in seas around the world. In most starfish and sea urchins, the larval tissues are used to create the juvenile animal. But in this starfish, the juvenile detaches from the body when it's time to leave the plankton for the seabed. The remains of the larva's body will then continue to swim at the sea surface for several weeks before eventually, without a mouth, it runs out of energy and dies. This is the larva of the netted dog whelk, a snail you can find in rock pools on the seashore. To counteract the weight of their shell, snail larvae possess two large swimming lobes fringed with beating hair-like cells called cilia. Aptly called spaghetti worms, these young worms are ready to settle to the seabed. Only a tiny fraction of all larvae will survive to settle to the seabed. Other plankton will eat many more. Jellyfish are among the most important predators. Like all jellyfish, these obelia, each one no bigger than a pinhead, have tentacles equipped with harpoon-like stinging cells. Jellyfish also include the largest members of the plankton. Although this young moon jelly is just five millimeters across, its bell will measure up to 40 centimeters across when fully grown. At the top of the plankton food chain are the fish and all those creatures that feed upon them. Nearly all fish lay their eggs in the plankton so that when the eggs hatch, the young larvae are surrounded by a plentiful source of food. Ultimately, dead and decaying plankton and faecal pellets settle slowly from the ocean's surface to the sea floor, taking with them the carbon they contain. This biological carbon pump makes the deep ocean a large carbon store. Over hundreds of millions of years, the burial of some of this carbon created the world's oil and gas reserves. Today, by burning this oil and gas, we're returning the carbon it contains to the atmosphere much faster than its removal by the plankton food web. This is leading to increased levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide and rising global temperatures. Living near the surface of the sea, planktonic organisms are particularly sensitive to changes in sea surface temperature. Scientists have discovered that the plankton are changing where they occur as the sea surface warms due to current climate change. This climate-driven shift in the distributions of plankton has had a knock-on effect for the whole marine food chain, including commercial fisheries. From the white cliffs of Dover and the oil and gas that fuel our everyday life, to the Earth's climate, the plankton from millions of years in the past to the present day affects every aspect of our lives. From creatures that live on the seabed to the seagulls in the sky and the fish that we eat, the sea would be a barren wilderness without the remarkable ocean drifters we call the plankton.